Our next speaker is Dr. Jocelyn Sylvester. Dr. Sylvester is the Director of Research of the Celiac Disease Program at Boston Children's Hospital. She received the 2019 Beyond Celiac Pilot and Feasibility Grant. She is a practicing pediatric gastroenterologist and her research interests are in the diagnosis and management of celiac disease. Her previous study, the Doggy Bag Study, wins my personal award for most memorable study name. Dr. Sylvester's Beyond Celiac Grant is for her investigation of the use of RNA sequencing as a more exact way to measure intestinal damage revealed in a biopsy. Welcome, Dr. Sylvester. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here and back in person, so thank you to Beyond Celiac for bringing us all together again. It's been far too long. Um, as you mentioned, I'm going to talk about my project for the uh, Pilot and Feasibility Award, uh, which was funded by Beyond Celiac. Luckily, I have some disclosures, um, which is, again, a sign of partnerships, a sign of progress, and a sign of the amount of activity that's happening in celiac disease. Since it's April, I'll mention that, yes, um, we have NIH, but we also have NIH, so some of our tax dollars that we're all sending this month are going to celiac disease research, which is fantastic. Um, for this talk, I want to focus a little bit on what do we need to do to get to a cure um, and how we need measures in order to do that, particularly of celiac disease um, activity. So first of all, when we think about a cure, we think about drugs. And when we think about drugs, we think about drug development. And so this is bridging that gap between preclinical studies or clinical studies through getting volunteers, conducting the trial, and finally getting a drug that's approved. And usually on this slide, I emphasize the need for people and the need for volunteers. But today, we're going to talk about another aspect, which is the need for outcome measurements. So it's equally important to have people volunteer for the trial as it is to ensure that the treatment is safe and also to have measures of whether or not it's effective. And in terms of effectiveness, there's really two ways of thinking about it. Um, and the first one is the criteria for approval in the US, which is does the drug impact how the patient feels, functions, or survives in a way that outweighs the risks of the treatment? And how does the drug compare to existing therapies, which is a difficult one in celiac disease that we'll save that discussion for another time. Um, in terms of celiac disease, since fortunately, although it's a highly morbid uh, condition, it's not a highly mortal condition, so survives is not necessarily um, the measure that we are going to be able to use to get something approved. Feeling is important but hard to measure, and function is something that maybe we can get a little closer to with some secondary endpoints. Um, and so these are the types of measurements we had in 2019. I'm not sure we've advanced much in the last two years, um, but we have symptoms, which is really a measure of feelings, and we have tools there, but particularly in pediatrics, we're somewhat limited. We have serology, which is our hammer that keeps looking for nails, um, and we have histology, which is really how we've been defining and diagnosing celiac disease since the beginning in the same way. And I put in brackets here glutenaminogenic peptides because I think they're more a marker of potentially adherence to the current therapy and not of disease activity itself, although clearly there's a relationship between gluten exposure and disease activity. And so when we think about histology, we really are doing the same thing now that we did with the first slides um, that we got for celiac disease. So if we go back to using histology to define celiac disease in pediatrics, the idea was that histology was really important, and when a person with a child with celiac disease is on a gluten-containing diet, they will have vellus damage, they'll have those crypt cells, they'll have more of those transitory cells, the mature ones will not be there, so the villi will be short. When you put them on a gluten-free diet, they recover, and then if you put them back on gluten, the disease will recur. And this is actually, perhaps more than enteropathy, the defining characteristic of celiac disease, which is responsiveness to gluten exposure. So these are biopsies that have been taken endoscopically. Initially, they were taken by capsule, but the same stains, the same preparation, the same sorts of measurements are being used um, as we have for a long time, and they have um, some limitations. So when we talk about describing these characteristics, um, there's a few classifications. The most commonly referred to one is the descriptive comp 
uh, classification, which was never necessarily really intended for widespread clinical use. Uh, Michael Marsh uh, first described it to try and explain the changes that we see, and this is really a rather crude way of what we just saw much more elegantly that we can see at a very detailed level with single cell sequencing. Um, and then Oberhuber revised it, um, and this is the classification we usually use today. So on the left, you have Marsh Zero, which is generally considered normal. So you have a tall villus and a relatively small crypt. As celiac disease progresses, moving from left to right across the slide, you have um, diminution of the villi and hypertrophy of the crypts, such that once you get to a Marsh 3 lesion, you're starting to have much more crypt than villus. And this is helpful because it's um, descriptive, it corresponds to what's seen on slides, and it helps to at least get some idea of the classification. The problem is that it's descriptive. It's very qualitative, which means that it's almost by definition very subjective. It's also categorical, which is a problem because in research studies it's much more useful to have a continuous measure because it's more responsive to change. Um, also, there's not an equal distance necessarily between the levels and the differences are somewhat artificial. And importantly, um, if you ask two pathologists to look at the same slide, you're not necessarily going to get the same answer, which makes it very difficult when you want to take a before biopsy and an after biopsy and try and compare the two of them. When you may have the same pathologist, you may have different pathologists, but you want to know that you're getting some sort of ground truth and whether or not this person is changing. And also, there's really usually a single read per biopsy. So the density of information per biopsy is perhaps suboptimal. So alternative approaches have been proposed based upon quantitative histology. And this is still an approach that's looking at the same white light microscopy. But now, instead of trying to figure out, OK, where along this progression are the villi, the idea is that you could actually measure a villus, and you could measure a crypt. And if you knew the measurements, you could then calculate a ratio. And this is more objective, it's quantitative, and you're going to have a continuous measure that hopefully reflects some of the dynamics we're seeing um, with damage in celiac disease. Now, I haven't talked much about inflammation and the intraepithelial lymphocytes, which also can be quantified um, and are another measure of activity uh, in celiac disease. An advantage of this is that you can then get multiple measures for biopsy because you have many, many Bellis crypt units on a biopsy. Now, we're not using this everywhere all the time uh, for many uh, good reasons. Um, oh, sorry, so here's the distribution of Bellisite crypt depth. And I apologize that this is backwards um, because when we look at the figure on the left, we're actually going from healthy to sick. And so this had initially been done looking at ascending velocite crypt depth. So this is the baseline biopsies from the proactive celiac disease clinical trial looking at velocite crypt depth. And you can see here it's a continuum. On the left, um, you have those who have very tall villi. Um, that middle point here is just above two. And then on the far right, you have those who have very, very flat villi, who fortunately, since this was a trial recruiting um, treated patients are not the majority of the sample. So what are some of the limitations of this approach? I think probably the most important um, is that it really depends on how you cut and what you're looking at because the intestine and the villi are a three-dimensional structure and by looking in cross-section we've reduced that to two dimensions and depending on the angle it's cut you can introduce artifacts in terms of what you're actually looking at and what you're actually measuring. It's also very time consuming and it's really mostly being done in very few laboratories, which means it's not accessible and it hasn't been um, extensively validated. Um, the inter-observer variability in other settings is really unclear and that's really important. If we want to be doing this on a mass scale, we need to have a way to be able to do it efficiently so I mentioned earlier the idea of orientation. This is an example of how on the left you have some profiles of villi and crypt. On the middle you have different ways of cutting them. And then on the right you have a picture of what that would look like in three dimensions. Now you don't have to turn your brain around like this. I think the important point is that 
it's almost like if you think about cutting a porcupine, if you cut it cross-sectionally, the spikes will be one length. If you cut it at an angle, they can actually look very short, even though they're not, and particularly because a porcupine is not flat, it's curved, and the intestine is the same. So these are actually cuts of the same biopsy that have been made at different angles. And so what we see here is that depending on how you cut, you can look like you have villi like you do on the left, um, or it can look like you have more crypt hypertrophy as you do on the right. I'll note that on the left, you can see there's all these little circles at the bottom. That's a sign that there's been some tangential cutting and something really important to look for when you're looking at biopsies um, and ask for better cuts. Now, I have to thank our previous speakers for doing a great job setting this up for me. So I will briefly recapitulate their talk, but not nearly so eloquently. So I think the main idea that really motivated this project is that the crypt villus axis is highly organized, and crypt cells are not the same as villus cells. And as the cells go along the villus, they mature, and they have different functions than they do at the bottom. And if these differences are reflected in gene expression, then can we use gene expression to look at the relative villus height and crypt depth in a way that is perhaps more reproducible? Uh, and so that was the hypothesis behind this project, that these changes that we see over the course of damage and celiac disease are actually correlated with changes in what the cells are doing, which is correlated with changes in what genes are being expressed. And so using a set of biopsies that have already um, been scored, can we then figure out what genes we may need in order to measure intraepithelial lymphocyte count, villus height, and crypt depth. And we separate out VHCD because we recognize they may not be the same thing. And um, I'll mention here that um, the earlier presentation was about single cell sequencing. The idea here is to use bulk sequencing. So instead of taking those quills and cutting them up into pieces and trying to reconstruct them, we're basically taking the whole porcupine and throwing it in the tube and trying to measure how much quills there are. And so this is more practical when you're thinking about what you can do with clinical samples, um, either recruiting people for a research study or in a research study. And it also gives um, potentially a higher um, area. So the first aim was to do the transcriptional profiling um, using bulk RNA-seq and to use regression to identify a gene panel that could then be used for validation in a second cohort of patients in Canada who we have been following and we have paired uh, diagnostic and 24-month follow-up biopsies. So we can compare how this method works not only in undiagnosed patients, but also in treated patients because it's not clear that they're necessarily going to have the same factors driving villus height and crypt depth. Beyond celiac has been amazingly, I'd say beyond supportive, has been fantastic and it really highlights the importance of partnerships and why we need to have a diverse community of people working towards something better for celiac disease. Thank so you.